Hi, everyone. Uh, so I am Shauna Gordon McKeon. As the nice helper person just said, I am going to be talking about deconstructing contributions. And we'll get to what exactly I mean by that in just a moment. Uh, first, who am I? Um, so I work for Open Hatch, which is a small nonprofit that tries to make the open source software community more welcoming to newcomers. Um, and I am the program director for Open Source Comes to Campus. And Open Source Comes to Campus is an event series where we go to college campuses around the country. Uh, we've gone to 27, we've had 27 events so far, nine so far this year, we're scaling up. Um, and the way that these events work is they're usually day-long workshops. In the morning, we do tutorials, cover things like, uh, well, what is open source? And then also, uh, how do open source projects communicate? How do they use issue trackers, mailing lists, IRC? tools like uh, version controller Git. We also have a uh, lunch session. Um, usually we try to do a career panel before it, give uh, students a chance to uh, meet people who are already active in open source. Um, and then in the afternoons, we do what we call our contributions workshop, which is where uh, our attendees make their first stabs at contributing to open source projects. Um, can anyone guess what the hardest part of the day is, what the most challenging part of the day is? Uh, it's the contributions workshop. And the question, why is contributing so frustrating? Why is it so hard? Um, and there's no easy answer to that. There's, in fact, many different steps that are a part of contributing, and each of them can present obstacles. Um, so what we're going to do during this talk is break down the act, general act of contributing into small parts that we can talk about where people are getting tripped up and how we can help them. We're going, to look at, uh, we're going to look at this from the perspective of newcomers who want to get involved uh, and how they can help themselves through these, these parts, as well as from the perspective of project maintainers who want to make their projects more welcoming. Um, so, uh, spoiler for the talk, one of the key themes is the importance of making implicit knowledge explicit and the special role that newcomers can play in doing that. Uh, the first half, I'm going to be going over what I have learned over the last year and change in running Open Source Comes to Campus. And the second half, we're all going to do an activity um, that's going to help us make implicit knowledge explicit and channel our inner newcomers. So there are, in fact, many more obstacles that I'm going to talk about in this talk. Uh, but I wanted to highlight some of the most important ones. Um, and these are finding a project, understanding the specific issue or task that they're working on, setting up the development environment, and their own internal anxiety and self-doubt. Um, so jumping right in, uh, depending on your definition, there's either thousands or millions of open source projects out there. Uh, whichever your definition is, that's a really overwhelming number. Um, and sometimes it can be easy to forget about this as a project maintainer, because by the time a newcomer gets to your project, they've already chosen it in some way. Uh, but from the perspective of a newcomer who just wants to contribute to open source, where do they, where do they even begin? Um, so at our events, we tend to kind of go around this problem by pre-selecting projects that we know are welcoming, have uh, easy to set up environments. Um, but this is, we also want to teach students how to find projects for themselves. Uh, so we do a, a activity called finding a project. Um, and we have, there are four phases of it. Brainstorming, coming up with ideas of the kinds of projects that they might be interested in. Uh, research, how do you find out more about those projects? How do you locate their tools, uh, their documentation? Evaluation, deciding whether or not this is in fact likely to be a good fit for you, and contacting the project. And I wanna take a moment to focus on evaluation because I think that's probably the most useful thing to talk about here. Uh, we tell students to evaluate projects on a few different metrics. One is activity. Uh, so we show them how to go into the issue tracker, the mailing lists, the version control history, and see how often stuff is happening with this project and figure out, is this a good fit for me? Um, a lot of times people can be overwhelmed by a very fast-paced project. Uh, conversely, if the project has not had anything done with it in the last year, probably not a great first project because probably no one will pay any attention to whatever contributions you want to make. Um, another aspect is responsiveness. Uh, if you're a newcomer, you're probably going to need a bit of feedback and hand-holding. 
I mean, it's something that's useful for everyone to have, but especially for a newcomer, you want to have a community where people will respond to your contributions, not just with a straight up yes or no, but with, here's some feedback on the contribution you've made. I like this part. This part doesn't quite fit in with our style. So we show students how to look for those things, um, looking at uh, patches that have been submitted. Do people respond with comments and code review, uh, or do people just merge or close? Um, Another element is size. This is kind of related to activities. Uh, I've had some attendees who are really excited to jump into a huge project and others that really want something small where they feel they can actually understand everything that's happening because that helps them feel more comfortable. Uh, and finally, culture. And this is one where we recommend students take a look at mailing lists and IRC, lurk for a little while, get a sense of how welcoming, uh, how safe the environment is. Um, it can be as straightforward as do you find the jokes that people make in the IRC channel funny? Um, because in that case, you'll be more likely to stick around and laugh and tell jokes yourself and then also maybe contribute. Uh, so you can read more about our finding a project activity at this link. Um, it's something we do at our events. You're more than happy if you wanted to use it for yourselves. And moving on to issue number two, uh, understanding issues. Uh, so learning how to read an issue tracker is really hard. Uh, and this is in large part because most issues are written for community members and maintainers and not for newcomers. Uh, I often write issues that are not written for newcomers despite the fact that my open source project is a project that's aimed at newcomers. Um, so it's a very easy trap to fall into when you're trying to like quickly report an issue and you don't have a lot of time to think about it. Um, so... Uh, so for this, uh, we recommend uh, going back through your issues before you would present them to a newcomer and making sure they have uh, this important information. Um, we didn't used to do this. Uh, when I joined OpenHatch, uh, we were just kind of taking our aggregator. We have this aggregator. You can see it up here. Uh, it takes uh, issue trackers from now over 800 projects and sort of combines them all to give you easy access to uh, issues from different projects. And as you can see, there's an uh, option to sort by bite-sized bugs. Um, and we used to present these. We would, we, would, we would definitely filter them, but there's a limit to how much filtering one or two people can do through dozens or even hundreds of, of issues. Um, and this was pretty demoralizing to students because we would present them with these bugs that were marked easy or small or bite-sized, and then there's nothing really worse than being presented with something easy and then not being able to do it. Uh, so. Uh, so definitely um, watch your language with that. Um, but so now what we do is we annotate the issues to provide the information that project maintainers might take for granted. Um, so for instance, uh, we talk about the skills that you'll probably need to address the issue. Talk about the tools that you'll probably need to use. Um, documentation that's relevant to the issue. Where you might want to start by making the change. Uh, and which specific community members can help mentor or give feedback. Um, and this is all information that can help uh, newcomers both select the task um, and then, if they've selected the task, get started working on it. Um, you can read more about how to prepare tasks. This is sort of like the overview um, at our in-person events handbook. The link is up there. Um, we also, in order to aid this annotation process and keep track of uh, these issues, uh, we have a Google Summer of Code student, Alana Hashman, uh, who is working on this. Um, and there's a link to her blog about this project at the end of the slide deck. So if you want to check that out, I recommend it. Uh, obstacle number three, setting up the development environment. Uh, so this picture is a group of students at Purdue University attempting to set up Privly. Uh, and as part of our events, we asked for feedback from students. And so we were asking our students what obstacles they faced when trying to contribute to this particular project. Uh, and the student wrote, lots of downloads, needed an account, had to create a database, tears clouding vision. <laughs> no, it's not literally true. I mean, you can tell from her smile and like the language used that she was actually really enjoying herself. Um, and, uh, but not everyone really enjoys having trouble setting up a development environments. I mean, some people totally do. I've met them, they exist. I'm not one of them. Uh, and there's actually a really happy ending to this story because we wrote about this in our blog and then the Privley people, including Jen Davidson, were like, 
oh my goodness, we should improve our setup process and did a setup documentation sprint and I think fixed like two dozen issues in their, their setup process and it was actually amazing. Uh, but this is like the happiest of all worlds and usually when someone has trouble setting up your development environment, it's not in the context of in-person mentors who notice and then blog about it. Uh, so um, it's ideal to work on your development environment in a more like conscious way and not hope that things will serendipitously happen and that newcomers will feel empowered enough to approach you and say, your, def your environment setup process uh, is problematic. So uh, from the handbook that I mentioned earlier, we have a set of advice about what you can do to make your project easier to set up, including, and again, this is about making implicit knowledge explicit, uh, what virtual environments you might need to, to run on, what dependencies you need, how to download the source and how to pick which source to download, how to build the project, how to test the changes you make, and how to contribute them back to the project. Uh, we also should recommend uh, including contact information in case people get stuck, an overview of the project to help people situate what they're doing, uh, and just generally as much documentation as possible. And you might be thinking to yourself, wow, that's a lot of information, Shauna. Uh, so one thing that we've started doing is what we call setup sprints. And this is where we, in real time, usually via IRC, have a project come and we match them with basically whoever, whatever volunteers of various experience levels want to try setting up their project. And usually we get a whole bunch of issues that come up and these can be reported directly to the person who's hanging out with us in IRC, who makes the changes and says, okay, try again. Um, and through this method, you can take your setup process from zero to uh, 10, 100, from on a zero to 10 scale, you can take it from zero to like eight or nine. Uh, quite quickly, um, yeah. Uh, and finally, the obstacle I want to uh, talk about that, that we've come across is anxiety and self-doubt. And these are, in addition to technical obstacles, there are a lot of psychological obstacles that newcomers can face, and that can make them hesitant about dipping their toes in the waters of open source. Um, and so, as someone who's been at, at these events and talked to a lot of newcomers, um, also via email and people who show up on our IRC channel, uh, I've heard these kinds of comments dozens of times. Uh, a lot of insecurity, a lot of not necessarily understanding how they fit into the open source world. Uh, for me, the key, what I found is the key is to validate these feelings as reasonable at the same time as you help someone Make, more, make themselves feel more comfortable. Um, so for instance, if a student says, I feel like I'm a burden on project maintainers, say, that's a really uh, empathetic thing of you to think that's really understandable. I sometimes feel like a burden when I feel like someone's helping me too much. But, and there are projects where you might be a burden if you like, went in there and like, kept trying to get someone to help you when they didn't want to. But we're, we're here to help you match you up with projects where people want you there. So you're not a burden to those maintainers. You're not a burden to us. Um, or if someone says, I'm not a coder, so I have nothing to contribute. Yeah, there's totally a stereotype of open sources being all about coding. I used to think that myself, but that's not actually true. So in addition to uh, working with our mentors and our community to try and uh, help people who are feeling insecure, we try to build this into the structure of our ev events as well. So, we have a career panel. You can see a picture from one of them here. Uh, and on that career panel, in addition to having our panelists talk about all of their successes in open source and all of the opportunities that are out there, we have them also talk about their insecurities. We ask, what is the biggest obstacle you face in open source? Or uh, when was the last time you were really frustrated? Um, we, uh, we're also working on building a mentorship program. And we hope that this will be both a technical mentorship and a, a way of giving social support. Um, and talking through insecurities in a one-on-one -on -one situation because that can be some of the, a more safe space for people to talk about their fears than in a large group. And finally, we have a new project uh, as of a couple weeks ago called Merge Stories. Uh, and Merge Stories is a website where people can go to share stories about contributions they've made to open source. And they're meant to show a really diverse array of types of contributions, both in terms of what the contributions are uh, from coding to organizing an event, uh, to doing a design, to doing some translation, um, as well as like different ranges of success and failure. So 
it can be this epic story of how you did this amazing, wonderful thing, or it can be the story about how you tried to contribute to a project and you completely failed and you were kind of sad about that. Um, so, uh, so yes, that's a, a new project of ours. Um, and for, uh, for project maintainers, uh, what you can do is you can role model this positive attitude to students. So talk about when you're feeling insecure or frustrated. Uh, I, whenever, whenever I'm having technical issues, uh, I'm less good about social issues, but especially when I'm having technical issues, I bring that into the Open Hatch channel and I ask people there. And I give both uh, channel regulars and longtime Open Hatch contributors, as well as newcomers, the chance to help me. Uh, I also try to be open about insecurities. That can be a little bit harder. Um, and at events, I'm honest when I'm confused. I am terrible at remembering the syntax of commands and will frequently have to pause and search up, you know, what comes after which. Does the pipe go, uh, does the carrier go this way or that way? Uh, and I try to normalize that. It's totally okay if you don't remember a specific syntax. It doesn't make you bad at open source. Um, and in fact, I have, uh, at an event, uh, about a year ago at this point, um, one of our volunteer mentors who is a uh, longtime programmer, Debian developer, very, gives off the impression of being like very on top of his stuff, was doing our Git tutorial and just got stuck. And for about five minutes in front of the group, uh, he was just, just trying different things and being like, I think this will work. No, no, that's still not working. Man, Git's hard. And, um, and later on during our contributions workshop, uh, there was a student who was having trouble with Git. And I was about to reassure her that you know, everyone has problems with Git, and she said, well, you know, if that guy who's been programming since forever can't even use, like, has trouble with Git, how am I supposed to be able to do it after 10 minutes? This is fine, like, this is, this is totally to be expected. Um, which was great, it was the healthiest attitude I've ever seen anyone have towards Git. And it was because our, <laughs> and it was because uh, the volunteer mentor totally unplanned, had trouble and role modeled being, well, you know, this, this just happens, this happens to everyone. Um, and additionally, the newcomer was role modeling a positive attitude too. So this is not just something for experienced people to role model, although I think it's imp very important for experienced people to role, mo role model it and people might forget uh, and just enjoy the sort of high of understanding how certain tools work without talking about the, s the little pockets where they still don't really understand what Git is doing. Uh, but the newcomer was also role modeling a positive approach. Um, and I think that really helped the other newcomers who were there at the event. So that's, something that other newcomers can do. Um, and hopefully, uh, with, all of these, uh, with all these efforts, people can feel uh, more comfortable about diving into open source. I like the cute puppy dogs. All right, so I already spoiled this, um, but there's a pattern to the advice that I've just given you. Uh, make implicit knowledge explicit, whether that's the implicit knowledge of where in the code base to look for the solution to this particular bug, or the social knowledge that everyone has trouble with this particular tool, or everyone has issues with, or most people have issues with feelings of insecurity. Um, make that explicit, make that a part of your culture. And use newcomers to do this. In each of the steps I've just talked about, newcomers can play an important role uh, in making this easier for you and your community and your project. Turns out newcomers have a sort of superpower. They can tell when uh, implicit knowledge is not being made explicit because they get really confused. Uh, so if you empower them to respond to that confusion with, hey, I don't understand, can you explain this to me? Can we document this? Can we make this part of our process? Then you've turned what feels to them like this awful burden uh, into some way that they can really help the project. Um, so engage newcomers, make sure they know how valuable they are and if you can, formalize that. So have specific tasks that newcomers can do um, that newcomers are really valuable for, whether that's testing documentation, testing the installation process, checking for usability. Uh, formalize those and direct uh, newcomers into them, into those spots, uh, especially if the newcomers aren't showing up with like, I have this specific thing I wanna work on. I don't recommend like discouraging them if they already have a specific thing they wanna work on. But I found that a lot of times newcomers will just show up and say, I want to, I want to help, I have no idea how. And so this can be a good place to, to put them. Uh, great, so my advice is basically engage newcomers, use newcomers, uh, but maybe you don't have newcomers. Maybe you just have yourself right now. Uh, good news, you were once a newcomer too. Uh, so you can channel your inner newcomer uh, 
And we're going to practice doing that with an activity. Yay, activities. Um, so uh, we're going to do an activity that uh, I have designed. And we're going to use this activity to help figure out where our implicit knowledge is and to brainstorm ways to make that explicit. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with a piece of paper and a pen. And I have a bunch of those. You can actually use your computers as well. Basically, I want you to be able to write stuff down is the key. Um, could I ask someone to help me pass these out? Great. Um, and then if people want pens. All right, everybody. Attention back to the front. This is just like an open source comes to campus event. Someone who can project more? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so let me just outline the steps of the activity before we begin. Uh, so you're going to have a partner. Uh, at least one of the people in your pair group I mean, you can do threes if you need to, it's OK. At least one of you should have made a contribu contribution to an open source project. If you're clustered next to a bunch of other newcomers, go out, meet new people on the other side of the room. Uh, is there anyone who's, uh, I guess, take a second, find your partner, and if you're both newcomers, raise your hand and I can help you. I realize this is a socially awkward thing, and I validate your yes. No, I by no means am specific to code. By co yes. What do you mean by newcomer? Like, a newcomer I am defining now as someone who has never made any kind of contribution to an open source project. So, uh, and I guess to help define what I mean by contribution, this can include helping a newcomer. It can involve uh, verifying a bug in an issue tracker. It can involve giving feedback, uh, even informal feedback, to a project maintainer. Uh, basically, we're going to be talking about a specific instance, and I want you to be able to have a specific instance to grab onto, at least one in your pair. Um, so if you can think of one thing that was a way in which you benefited an open source project, that's good enough. Um, is there anyone who feels like they don't have that in their pair group? All right. All right, so the... If you're shy about this, I can also go around and help you figure stuff out. Cool. Are you raising your hand because you need? I think most people have in here have made a contribution, so I think that's why there's not hands being raised. Cool. Great. So back to the front again. Pause. You'll have moments to talk to your partner. Great. So the activity is going to consist of three steps. Each step is going to take somewhere between three and five minutes. Um, and you're going to write down answers to a series of questions that I'm going to show on this board. Uh, once you feel like you're ready to answer the questions, your partner is going to ask them to you out loud. I should hear like a buzz of sound. Um, and this should force you to actually answer the questions and not just skip them because you don't know. So you should either have an answer to give to your partner or to be able to explain why this particular question does not apply to your contribution. If your partner does not understand your explanation in response to the question, they should say, I don't understand. Ideally, they can say, I don't understand this part of it. Um, so you should be having an actual conversation with your partner about, about your contribution. And again, this will take three steps. Uh, please be mindful that when I call attention to the fact that we're going to the next step, uh, and not get completely lost in talking with your new friend about your contributions. Yes? So you're each, uh, so if you have a newcomer in your group, that person can just work with the maintainer and help them do an extra good job on the activity. Um, 
And if there's multiple people, you should be each doing this. Um, so here's step one. Think of a contribution you've made. Uh, you should try to definitely get to the bold questions. And if you have more time, you can talk about the non-bolded question, which is the second set. All right, five minutes, go. And feel free to raise your hand if you have confusion, and I can answer it.
have with this a limited time period and I want to get through all of the steps, oh, you can of course go back and revisit this activity at any point that you would like and take as long as you'd like to answer these questions. I also have backup questions in addition. Uh, but I tried to keep things reasonable. Okay, so that was step one. Um, hopefully you both got to at least talk a little bit about uh, step one. Step two, what did you need to know to make the contribution that you made? Again, the, more imp not, mm, the questions I want you to try to answer first are on the top in bold, and the, uh, the other questions are not in bold on the bottom. Um, and again, try to get to everyone. You have more of a sense of how long these five minutes actually are this time. Uh, all right, back to it.
everybody. Back of the room. Again, my apologies for interrupting. I don't think it's on. Um. All right. Time to move on to the third and final step. Again, you can totally revisit this activity and give it more time uh, later. But we're going to move on to the third step is, how did you learn what you needed to know? Um, so maybe you learned it a long time before you made this contribution. Maybe you learned it in the process of making this contribution. Maybe it was really easy to learn. Maybe it was incredibly difficult to learn. Uh, but I want you to think about and write down how you got to this knowledge. Um, and, and in the process of doing that, you can also think about, uh, are there ways that you can make this process by which you got the knowledge available to other people? So make it explicit not just for yourself, but for everybody. All right, have at it. This is the third and final step.
stop you all in the middle of what seemed like really enthusiastic discussions. We're starting to run out of time. Uh, and obviously, we're not going to have enough time for everyone to share their activity with the group. So I wanted to briefly go, other, go over uh, different ways you can have sharing time other than right now. Uh, so you've all just generated a bunch of really important information. You've taken a bunch of implicit info and made it explicit. And the number one thing you can do is contact the maintainers of the projects that you contributed to and talk about how you contributed to them. Say, oh, this piece of documentation was uh, really excellent. It's a great resource to point people to. Or uh, this documentation, I don't know, it didn't really work for me, but I found this other website that had that documented the process. Maybe you want to link to it. Um, or whatever the particular piece of implicit knowledge you uh, that you have made explicit. So I highly recommend sharing them back directly to the project that you contributed to. Maybe it's your project, in which case that's great, very low latency of doing that. Um, another place that you can share that information is on the Merge Stories site that I mentioned before. Uh, there is, you can see up in the corner, there is a submit button where you can talk about the process of making a contribution and talk about all of the different pieces of implicit knowledge that you had to confront, all of the different tools that you used, all of the feelings that you felt. Uh, you don't have to write about your feelings if you don't want to. I just encourage it. Um, so that's another place that you can put these stories and additional stories. Um, and uh, we do have a few minutes for either questions or for people to talk about the activity. But before we do that, since it's pretty much at the end of the time period and people might want to go get cookies, I understand. I just wanted to briefly uh, say thanks um, to the Open Hatch volunteer community, um, especially Ashish Laroya um, and Britta Gustafsson. Um, I also wanted to reference, there's a blog post, the Privley Sprint that I mentioned earlier, as well as Alana's Summer of Code project, as well as the images I used in this slide. Uh, so that's all on the slides which are going to be in the notes. So back to sharing time, and we are at exactly 3.15 for those of you who want to get online for cookies, but I will stay here as long as people want to talk about stuff. Um, Thanks. <laughs>